some relationships break the rules. Territorial and terrifyingly strong, lions don't usually accept people into their pride. Ever get the feeling you've been surrounded by lions? <laughs> I get it every day. Kevin Richardson seems to have a dream job, looking after lions and other animals that have come to accept him as one of the pride. But there's feuding and fighting. When new arrivals send fur flying, and a deadly battle for dominance in another family leaves an orphan on his own. As the park that's become a refuge for the most vulnerable faces financial ruin. I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. The private wildlife sanctuary dubbed the Kingdom of the White Lion covers almost seven square kilometers. It's home to leopards, hyenas, and lions. One of the largest and most impressive prides in the park is dubbed the Big Kings. The family is headed by four males, two tawny lions, Rafiki and Siam, and two white lions, Alex and Kaiser. But they are growing restless. White lion Kaiser is challenging the other males for dominance. Kevin fears one of them might get hurt, so he's stepping in as peacemaker. Little big, little big boy. A little big boy. As soon as he reached sexual maturity, everything changed. Um, and he just became interested in one thing, and that was the woman. He's just uh, taken it upon himself to be dominant over them all the time and he gets extremely aggressive and unpredictable. And this results in extreme fighting uh, between him and the other lions in this group. One lioness in particular is the object of Kaiser's affection. Already battling to pay the bills, Kevin can't afford any new cubs to house and feed. Females are given contraceptive implants. But males still retain their natural mating instincts. Unable to satisfy these natural urges can make them tense and frustrated. Kaiser needs a new home before his frustrations lead to violence. It's only a matter of time before we land up with someone or some uh, lion being killed in this group, um, or exorbitant vet bills, because a lion's got its half his face hanging off. And that's, that's the reason why we're going to have to uh, move him on. All of Kevin's 38 lions have been bred in captivity. Seven of them are rare white lions, identical to their tawny relatives, except for their coloring. But keeping so many big predators is expensive. To run a park of this nature, you are looking in the region of around about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month, and that's just maintenance, anti-poaching patrols, staff, keeping the electric fences clean. You got your little magic pliers, you know, feeding the lions, watering the lions, making sure they've got proper veterinary health care. They've been detected. Vehicles, petrol, fetching food. It's a big job. Uh, people, people don't realize what, what a mammoth job it is, taking on, looking after 
uh, a lot of lions, you know, not just one lion. It's, you know, a lot of mouths to feed. Kevin helped to set up the park as a giant film set for a movie about a white lion. It was his job to look after all the animals on set. Once the film crew packed up and left, the lion stayed, joined by other cats and animals from another reserve, creating a new park, the Kingdom of the White Lion. It's hoped that profits from the film will pay to establish the park. Managing the reserve is a full-time job that includes caring for animals from the time they're born. There's a nursery for cubs, like these young lions, the last to arrive before all of the lionesses in the park were implanted with contraceptives. Yeah, your tongue is rough. So this area over here is known as the nursery area, um, where all the, the orphaned or abandoned youngsters come. And in this particular case, we have two lions that are not related, uh, Mufumo and Vayetzi, about 10 months of age. And these little hyenas were also abandoned. So they all land up here in the nursery area where they can get the, the care and the love and the attention that they need. The two lion cubs are growing up fast. They'll need more space and the chance to mix with adults to develop social skills needed to thrive in a pride. Incorporating the youngsters into a pride will be difficult. Newcomers are often rejected or attacked. Their easy life in the nursery is about to come to an abrupt end. Such care costs money, around 12,000 pounds a month. Kevin and his backers need the White Lion film that was shot here to make money. Profits are desperately needed to pay for running costs and the transformation of the reserve into a zoo for paying visitors. If the cash they need doesn't start to flow in, the park and its inhabitants face an uncertain future. Bandit, you're heavy, my buddy. If, if the film, you know, for whatever reason now doesn't get out there, um, the consequences are that the park might have to shut down and we might be having to find homes for 37 lions, 20 odd hyena and the rest of the, you know, the animals that live here. Well, it would be all for naught, my life's work, if, uh, if that happened. And, um, yeah, I can't even begin to imagine that, so. So what do you think? Having started a family of their own, Kevin and his wife Mandy have gambled everything on the success of the White Line project. They hope baby Tyler will one day inherit a thriving business built on conservation. Behind the scenes, obviously running a park of this magnitude, and it's a constant worry for us because if we don't find the income and keep things going, then what happens to the animals, which is obviously Kevin, my number one priority. On top of financial worries, managing big cats in confined spaces is a full-time job. In the wild, there's plenty of space to roam, but in an enclosure, family feuds can erupt into deadly fights. That ear is ringing. In one pride, three young lions are approaching the age when, in the wild, they would leave to form a pride of their own. They're starting to clash with their father. They'll have to be moved before one of them is seriously hurt. Kevin decides to relocate them to a new enclosure, together with three other young lions. Having hand-raised and spent intimate time with all of his big cats, Kevin has a good insight into which of them should get along together. But in this case, there's an added complication. I'll tickle you to death. I'm gonna tickle you a hyena that thinks it's a lion. <laughs> Spunny, the hyena, has grown up with three of the young lions from the time he was born.
Lions and hyenas are usually considered to be arch rivals that will attack each other at any opportunity. But Spani has developed feline behaviors that would make him an outsider among other hyenas. He'll stay in the pride where he's long been accepted as an honorary lion. With the lions, actually, he lives a pretty cool life. He's one of the pride. They live a very lazy life. They're both very social animals. Best of mates, in fact. Let's go. But go. three newcomers go. are joining the gang. It remains to be seen how they'll interact with a pride member that looks suspiciously like a hyena. We're going to release them today, uh, see how it goes today, especially with Spunnies, the, the hyena. And depending how it goes, by, by 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock's the feeding time. If it's all going well, we'll feed them together. If we suspect that it's a little bit awkward and things aren't going so well, then we'll maybe remove them and take them back. Experienced keeper Rodney Nombakana is the only other person allowed to handle animals in the reserve. Young lions are notoriously unpredictable. As the two groups meet and establish a hierarchy, nervous tension can easily turn to aggression. When they fight like that, and I mean, it makes a lot of noise. And, and to a human being, it seems very scary. But to lions, with their thick skin and all of that, just a wah-wah-wah-wah-wah, they immediately are showing who's more dominant than the next. One group lays low while the other three lions and Spunny the hyena look to Kevin for reassurance. <laughs> so at the moment, we're in a bit of a partate situation. We've got this group, um, including Spunny. Spunny's is on the periphery, and myself, and the three newcomers, <laughs> and it's segregation. But it's gone really well. I'm, I'm really happy about it. There's been a little bit of nose touching and, and that kind of interaction. No aggression from either side. The two groups soon integrate and start to make friends. That's fantastic. Even Spunny finds his place in the new pride. Hyena wins. But the real test is still to come. Feeding time will determine whether the new group can coexist peacefully or whether a battle for a best morsel will descend into sectarian war. Rivalries between male lions over pack dominance rage across the plains. But only one can be crowned the king. Lion Ganglands, tonight at 8 on Nat Geo Wild. It's feeding time for a new pride nicknamed the Terrible Teens. And an ultimate test of whether the two groups that have only just moved in together can get along. Initial squabbles subside when they realize there's enough to go around. Bizarrely, the new pride includes Spunny the hyena, raised with the lion since birth. He thinks he's one of them and has been accepted as such. Lions, like people, have individual personalities that can clash when different groups are brought together. The terrible teens seem to be getting along just fine. But elsewhere in the kingdom of the white lion reserve, another big cat is lonely and left out. Thor was a star of a film shot in the park. The film that manager Kevin Richardson hopes will help pay for a plan to turn the reserve into a visitor attraction. Income is desperately needed to pay for the care of animals like Thor. Lions are social animals, and Thor has been on his own for far too long. But there's a shortage of suitable companions. Thor's about seven years old now and he's way past the age of forming new bonds with other male lions. Come, 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 come. So it's not an option, you know, to put a male lion with Thor. The only option really is females. 
it's just a really difficult um, situation at the moment because uh, the nature of the kingdom is that we've actually got far too many males compared to females and the females that would go with Thor would have to be on the pill and we don't really want to just acquire two female lions uh, to put with Thor. Long walks provide much needed companionship but despite Kevin's best efforts he is increasingly concerned that Thor is lonely. When the days go by, and, and I've had a busy week, the only lion that really is in the back of my mind is old Thor, because I know he definitely needs some love and attention. Out of all the lions I walk with, this must be my favorite, because I know how much he needs this enrichment. This is really important to him, living as a bachelor. So, you know, whenever he sees me, it's like, come on, Kev, can we go for a walk? Can we go for a walk in the greater area? So I try and take him out more than the others because they've got, you know, each other's company. Hello, my big boy. <laughs> what you been doing? Hey, you having fun? Despite their close friendship, Kevin realizes that the lonely bachelor needs the company come of on. his own kind. They need to be robust females, strong enough to hold their own against the big male. Only two lionesses fit the bill. But they're already part of a stable pride, and there's no guarantee they'll get along with the temperamental Thor. Before introducing them to the lonely bachelor, Kevin will ensure the females are fitted with contraceptive implants. He can't afford any more cubs to feed. He's counting on the coming feature film to bring in some much needed income. But publicity shots are interrupted by yet another creature crisis, this time in the hyena den. Civil war has erupted in one of the groups. Hyenas live in matriarchal clans, ruled by females. They communicate using a complex language of body movements and sounds to establish their social hierarchy. Males are lowest in the social rank. In the warring clan, a mother is fighting with a daughter that's challenging her position as a dominant female. Hey, what's up with you guys? Eh? Hey, Shans? Kevin can tell that something's up in the hyena hey. den. Hello, guys. Let's see that. Hey, what's the matter? You all acting nervous, eh? He's in for a big surprise. Cody? Hey, what's going on with you? The dominant mother of the hyena clan is nowhere to be seen. Where's Gina? She's in the den. She's usually first to the fence to greet Kevin, but not today. We're all acting very strange. I guarantee you something's up. Eh? Given the battle brewing between mother and daughter, he investigates the den. And there's a big surprise in store. What? <laughs> He's got some cubs. There's three. She's got three. This is very, very unusual. Hey, my girl. This is the first time she's had three. I feel like a little kid on Christmas. This is amazing because she's actually very calm. Gina's a very protective mother. In fact, ferociously so. You can imagine she will protect these cubs at all costs. Newborn hyena cubs are vulnerable to a deadly threat within their own clan. Babies are often cannibalized by rival adults and even their own siblings. Kevin will need to keep a close eye on them.
Their mother is also alert to any potential threat. Hello, boy. Sure. Hey, mommy doesn't want me to come too close. Nice, 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 nice. Sure. It's nice. That's nice. Mom and, mom and dad. Turned out to be an awesome day. For Kevin, one of the biggest rewards is watching young animals mature into adults. And those closest to his heart are two lionesses he rescued as cubs. Uh, well, over here we have Meg and Amy, probably two lionesses that I'll never have a better relationship with. Uh, our love affair started pretty much eight years ago when mom abandoned them. They probably weigh in at about 180 kilograms each, but their characters are so different. Although they've had the same upbringing, the same input, um, the same amount of love, the same amount of discipline, Amy is a little bit more reserved, sometimes can be petulant. <laughs> Meg, on the other hand, is just the most boisterous, outgoing, fun-loving lioness you'll ever come across. And that's why I can go swimming in the river with her. She's just full of confidence. If I go in the river, she wants to go in the river. Lions will usually avoid water. Meg's extraordinary behavior seems to reflect her trust in Kevin. A big adult lioness coming up, rubbing her head on your face, feeling her tongue. It's like 80 grade sandpaper doing this. You can't stop them from doing it because it's their way of showing affection. So you've just got to endure the pain and I tell you something, it's really worth it. Kevin has worked with big cats for more than 12 years. Mm -hmm but has been criticized by some who believe he risks his life unnecessarily. Yeah, I get, I get criticized all the time for the way I interact with the lions. You know, a lot of people say, do you really need to interact with them that intensely? And, you know, it's, it's the only way I really know. But Kevin believes his intimate approach to big cats from the time they're cubs is key to his success. He claims he can read their moods and personalities, what they like and dislike. He won't interact with any lions he doesn't know. So Meg and Amy are just those two unique individuals that I can do this kind of thing with quite freely and truly if I fell asleep in this enclosure I honestly can say I'd, I, I fear not that they would jump on me and try and eat me while I'm sleeping. It's something he wouldn't dare to attempt with wild lions, assuming he could find any in the first place. Wild populations have declined by 80% in less than 30 years. It's estimated that there are only 25,000 left. White lions are the rarest of all and can only be found in a small region of South Africa. Kevin has been invited to discover why there are so few white lions left in the wild. He is flying to the Timbavati Nature Reserve, part of the Greater Kruger National Park, a vast wilderness area covering more than 23,000 square kilometers. Only 11 white lion births have been recorded in the last five years, and of those, only three are thought to have survived. Kevin has joined ranger Patrick O'Brien and tracker Albert Ubisi to try and find them. If they succeed, it'll be the first time Kevin has seen a white lion in the wild. So, yeah, we're not far now. Um, we've been tracking the lions for some time now. 
and we know it's the group that we're looking for because we can see the, the adult females and we can also see the cub spur. So it's just, I reckon, around, around the corner there. Um, Albert's uh, told us we should expect to find some lions, hopefully. Sure enough, Kevin is rewarded with his first sighting of the rarest lions in the world. White lions display a rare recessive gene that inhibits the production of color in their fur. But they are not albinos. Their paw pads and lips are pigmented, and often their eyes are bluish instead of the usual golden brown. This rare gene is also carried by normal tawny lions in the region. But all lions must fight to stay alive in the wild, and the odds of survival are slim. Only around one in five survive to the age of two. One of the greatest threats comes from dominant males that try to kill any rival's offspring. But I mean, that just goes to highlight how difficult it is um, for the white to survive. I mean, we know mortality in high lions is high. That's correct, yeah. But, I mean, the fact that these lions have made it to 14 months, that's yeah, a really, it's really done very good, well, good yeah. sign. Eh? Luckily for these girls, both are females, and of course that's very important to, uh, for the old pride and for us, of course, which means that girls always stay in a pride, they never emigrate. Uh, of course, lionesses are the core foundation of a pride, and with these two girls staying in the pride, that just means that, of course, it's going to be great in the future to see these two girls grow up and become adults. Isn't that going to be fantastic? I've Can you imagine yeah, coming here in, uh, in uh, two or three years from now and seeing these massive adult white lions hunting? I'll, I'll, and, uh, I'm, I'm going to be back, I'll tell you that be much. Very, I will be back. Very impressive. Captive white lions, like those in Kevin's protected reserve, obviously have far better chances of survival. He believes the best way of ensuring their survival in the wild is to conserve the dwindling tawny lion population that carries the white gene. As you know, at the kingdom, uh, several white lions that I work with and I've always just been maintaining that we should be conserving the tawny gene in this area specifically and, you know, when I was told that these cubs were born, I was yeah. like, you see, I mean, that, that just goes to prove that these tawnies carrying the gene. You know, the, both mothers are tawny, and yeah. uh, that clearly indicates that, you know, you don't have to be a, a white lioness Precisely. to produce white cubs. And there's a very good chance, and maybe that uh, white gene is a lot more prevalent than what we actually think it is. And even more reason to be protecting Exactly. these tawnies in this area. Exactly, yeah. and, and this is what's so important about this area is the fact, you know, this is the only place that they are naturally yeah. still found. Yeah. The trip has given Kevin time to reflect on the role he'd like his reserve to play in lion conservation. If he can transform the park into a public attraction, he hopes it will help inspire people to support conservation. But he needs money to do it. And that depends on the success of a feature film. The future of the majestic animals in the kingdom of the White Lion Reserve depends on the success of a feature film starring its feline residents. Manager Kevin Richardson thinks nothing of play fighting with a quarter ton lion. But public speaking is another matter, and he has to face the cameras to promote the film that's vital to the future of his beloved animals. Well, it's, it's tricky because when you're working with uh, um, animals that can eat you... you gotta, you gotta Four be years in the making, it's hoped the film will make a profit that can be used to transform the park into an attraction for paying visitors. I'm not joking, but, I mean, the film took four years to make. And believe you me, when a lion doesn't want to do something, he does it. And you need better listen to him. You better listen to him. Over the following days, the movie receives its first reviews. City vibe, yeah, feline feast. Um, four out of five. The critics have been kind, but it remains to be seen whether the film is attracting enough cinema goers to turn a profit. 
It costs money to look after big cats like Kaiser, a white lion that's outgrowing his enclosure and ganging up on the fellow members of his pride. But there's just no room left in Kevin's reserve. A lion like Kaiser, obviously, we'd like to find him a really good home. So you've got to go into you know, the details of who's this person, how long have they been involved with lions, um, do they have the right uh, documentation, what's the facility like, what's his enclosure going to be like, because he's really been used to a great life. It could take months to find Kaiser a good home. Unscrupulous overbreeding of lions in South African parks and zoos means there are already too many big cats looking for homes. Some end up in so-called canned hunts, in which they are released to be pursued and shot by trophy hunters. Kevin simply won't allow that to happen to one of his cats. He can only hope that Kaiser calms down and stops causing trouble in his enclosure. In the nursery, two cubs that have grown up together are fast approaching adolescents. They'll have to be introduced into an adult pride to gain the confidence and social skills they'll need to thrive. I'm a firm uh, believer in, in cradle to grave. And for every animal that you hand raise, you really are responsible for his destiny. So if, if an animal has been taken away for whatever the reason, uh, it's a lifetime commitment. And you've got to really figure out what's going to happen with that animal when it gets older. Come on, boys. Come, boom. Come, boys. Come, the boys. cubs have a big week Come. ahead of them. Come. Let's go. Good boys. The plan is to gradually introduce the cubs to the adult members of their new pride, the so-called terrible teams. If the cubs were suddenly dumped into the deep end, fighting and serious injuries could result as the adults follow natural instincts to show the cubs who's boss. Concerned that the terrible teens may gang up on the cubs, Kevin decides to split the six adults into two groups of three. The cubs will stay protected inside their cage in case there's any trouble. I'm a little bit apprehensive because these three are, are, are notoriously aggressive, um, especially when it comes to um, lions, uh, other lions that they don't know. But they, you know, they speak a different language to us, so maybe they'll know something that we don't. Uh, maybe Mafuma and Vayetzi, being smaller and younger, will just submit. If that happens, it's fantastic. If it doesn't, we'll have to uh, conjure up another plan. Hello, boys! Oh! Hello, boys! Nicely. Who's that? Look, they've been so nice and friendly. Despite Kevin's initial anxiety, the mood seems relatively relaxed. This is much, much better than I expected. I really, this is phenomenal. There was like almost some form of, you know, acknowledgement that we know we are a little bit weaker than you guys, you three, we two, we younger. So it was really, really good. Some new friends. Oh, it is so tempting to release Mafuma and Vayetzi with this group because it's gone so well. But in, in all the years of experience, I've realized one thing, overconfidence is a bad thing. And I just think we should wait probably another one or two introductions like this before we release because it's a, it's, they can almost lure you into a false sense of security. Um, where you think, ah, oh, everything's okay, and as soon as you open this gate, it's a different story. 
Next, Kevin introduces the youngsters to the more unpredictable half of the terrible teen's pride. They're the oldest and most unruly trio of the group. Quickly surrounding the van, they seem to sense the new arrivals inside. Once again, the cubs are kept in the cage for their own safety. It's not the terrible teens, but one of the cubs that gets aggressive, albeit from behind the safety of a cage. Come on, be nice. Be nice. Why are you being a naughty boy? Don't be a naughty boy. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Eh? That was really incredible interaction. It, it, it went exactly opposite to how I thought. I thought the youngsters would be a lot more submissive and roll on their backs, and that these guys would show some aggression and show some authority. It was exactly the opposite. The, the youngsters came at them full of aggression, and these guys were completely passive. <laughs> How are you doing in and amongst all of this? Kevin keeps the van open for an hour, hoping that relations will improve. Hey, Vajetsi! So I think uh, what I'm going to do is let them all out together. They actually, we've done this a couple of times. Um, there's hardly any interest. The only line that's really showing any form of aggression is Vajetsi. That's because he's a bit nervous. Mafumu is completely relaxed. These guys are not going to do anything bad. I think if anything, it's going to come aggression from the youngsters. These guys might give a wah, 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 and it's going to be all over. So I'm going to go and let them out. Be nice. OK. Without the protection of a cage, Cub Vietzi's bravado quickly fades into submission. The terrible teens immediately gang up on the youngster, stop, stop, and stop, Kevin stop, has stop, no stop, choice stop, but stop. to break up the fight with pepper spray. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I just got a, a hunch that it would be okay to let them all out. They're all in jolly moods. And especially the youngsters have been extremely submissive. So that's... Uh, <laughs> until Mr. Bandit decided to pick on them. <clears throat> and once he started picking on them, Bobcat came in from behind, where I had to defuse the situation with a little bit of help from a friend called Pepper Spray. <laughs> Nice. I want nice, nice. Nice, nice. In such cases, pepper spray is used as a last resort to stop fights breaking out, protecting the cats and himself. An accidental bite could prove fatal. Kevin rarely uses pepper spray, and it's always him that suffers most. The terrible teens have lived up to their reputation. Introducing them to the cubs hasn't worked as well as he'd hoped. Discord seems to have spread to the hyena den, where a deadly power struggle is unfolding between a mother and daughter. Hello, Gina. Hey, Ma. How's your cub? Hey. Two of Mother Gina's newborn cubs have disappeared. What's happening? Hello, my girl. But the matriarch is out of the den and appears restless. Why are you out the den? You should be with your baby. He investigates the underground den. There's three. Hey, my girl. Hello, Gina. There's three hyenas. <laughs> Hold on, I'm a bit confused here. You're not going to believe this Oslo. Hey. There must be her cubs. I didn't even know she was pregnant. Hey, hello, my girl. Hello, Gina. Hello. 
The matriarch's remaining cub is still alive, but her daughter, Oslo, has also taken up residence in the den and given birth to two more new cubs. Kevin believes the daughter may have killed and eaten her mother's cubs in a battle for dominance. Yet the two seem to be coexisting peacefully enough. Kevin hopes it's the end of bloodshed in the clan. But the civil war is about to escalate. What's going on in here, guys? Eh? A mother and daughter are killing each other's cubs in a savage battle to dominate the hyena clan. My goodness, what's going on here? Eh? A total of four cubs have disappeared. Ooh. Matriarch Gina is avoiding the den. It's a bad sign. She seems a little bit uh, calm and friendly, and that's a bit worrying, because if she had a cub, she would be a lot more uh, cautious and uh, protective. The hyenas are behaving strangely. The daughter and another male are raising their tails, a clear sign of aggression. These guys are showing signs of a little bit too much aggression. And I think we should start hopping out of here, right? Kevin investigates the den that just days ago was alive with newborn cubs. Let's just see if I can entice him down here. This is crazy. It seems that only one cub has survived the bloody family feud. If he leaves it be, chances are it too will be killed and eaten. There's definitely been some chaos on outside. I've looked everywhere and I can't find the other two siblings. It looks like either Gina, Gina's probably come and uh, killed one of Oslo's. And Oslo's in return killed one of Gina's, so Gina's got no cubs left. Oslo's only got one, and I'm just afraid that if I leave this cup here, yeah. I'm going to have no cubs whatsoever. Come by. If the cub is to have any chance of survival, Kevin needs to remove it and bring it up himself. Raising the hyena cub is another full-time job with another costly mouth to feed. The park and its animals need cash to survive. And Kevin's pinning his hopes on making a profit from a feature film shot on the reserve. But it seems box office takings won't be enough. The park needs to be um, operating and basically paying for itself uh, in, in about six months from now. And if that isn't the case, yeah, again, it's going to be quite a, a battle to, to uh, see where we can kind of get funding from and uh, see if we can save it, um, because I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. Hello, Ishki. It's not just hey. Kevin's wife and baby who are counting on the park to succeed. The big cats, hyenas, and the staff that look after them are all part of one big extended family. We've been with these animals since they were young, so they are like, we are part of their family. I don't even want to think about what it would do to me if uh, for some reason you know, the lions are taken away from me or I'm taken away from them. Um, it, would, yeah, it would be, I don't know how to describe it. Twelve years ago I made a little pact with two lions called Town Napoleon and the commitment was to really see them through to uh, old age and that's, that's a basically a lifetime commitment and I'm not going to throw in the towel uh, just because we've got a couple of financial uh, issues. 
Like the bush trails stretching before Thor, the lonely lion, the road ahead seems uncertain and strewn with shadows under a setting sun. Some relationships break the rules. Territorial and terrifyingly strong, lions don't usually accept people into their pride. You ever get the feeling you've been surrounded by lions? <laughs> I get it every day. Kevin Richardson seems to have a dream job, looking after lions and other animals that have come to accept him as one of the pride. <laughs> But there's feuding and fighting. When new arrivals send fur flying, and a deadly battle for dominance in another family leaves an orphan on his own. As the park that's become a refuge for the most vulnerable faces financial ruin. I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's, uh my life and soul. The private wildlife sanctuary dubbed the Kingdom of the White Lion covers almost seven square kilometers. It's home to leopards, hyenas, and lions. One of the largest and most impressive prides in the park is dubbed the Big Kings. The family is headed by four males, two tawny lions, Rafiki 